Hi everybody. So I am planning to continue my computability playlist, but uh, this is not that. This is something different. Um, this is essentially going to be a YouTube version of a series of talks I gave in my logic seminar at my school that I'm doing my PhD in. Uh, they were introductory talks to uh, the concepts you see up in front of you, computability and the first incompleteness theorem. There are actually two incompleteness theorems. And the focus of these talks is going to be on getting to the first one. I'll tell you about the second one, but it's the first one is what we're mostly concerned with. Yeah, I'm not really quite sure what the format is going to be. I'm not sure whether this is going to be a series of 20-minute videos or a single five-hour video. Uh, I'm, I'm not really quite sure of that yet, so I can't say here. Um, but it is meant to be standalone, and it is meant to be somewhat approachable by everybody. So basically, I have two demographics in mind for... Um, for these videos. The first demographic are essentially undergrad math majors and, and maybe undergrad or graduate level computer science majors that are interested in the concepts of theoretical computer science and the incompleteness theorems but are intimidated by them because essentially what this is going to be is like a guided tour to obtain a uh, respectable understanding of them without actually uh, you know doing the math yourself. Um, so it's definitely there for you guys. And, it, and it's, it's honestly unfair to what I'm about to do to say that, that, that what we're about to do is not a proof. It's not a proof fully, but it's definitely uh, proofy. It's proofish. It smells like a proof. It tastes like a proof. Um, so it's there for th those guys. And then, so that's the first demographic that I'm interested in. The second demographic is actually um, uh, people that consider themselves uh, Marxists or, or people that are interested in cybernetics or people that are interested in socialism or communism. Uh, that sounds pretty odd considering the title of the series. And I, I should be honest, I don't think the entire series is going to interest you, but I think the first bit of it will. Because um, as people like that, we are interested in systems. Um, we want to change the system, and so we are interested in systems. Um, and what we're going to see as we as we to go through essentially a, a, a philosophical deep dive into what is computability really, we're going to realize that all systems are in some sense computation. And we're also going to make, I'm, I'm going to basically put out a hot take that uh, history itself is computation. And that is what Marx was trying to say with some of the things that he said. So uh, everything is computation. I'm a computability theorist, of course I think that, but I'm going to try to convince you of that. Um, and I'm going to also make a clear demarcation of when that section is done and when like the, 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 the march towards the incompleteness theorem will begin so that those people can, can exit stage left when, when, when that happens, if they want to. Obviously, I'm going to try to make this whole thing accessible to uh, everybody that's interested, but uh, that's the plan. So anyway... Here, that's, that's the miniseries. Uh, so here are the goals. The goals are to understand computability as a philosophical concept and how it applies to reality, to demystify the objects that we call computers, to understand the relationship between computation and mathematics as a human activity, and to arrive naturally, naturally in, in massive, heavy lifting quotes, uh, naturally at the first incompleteness theorem by way of the above. What I mean by naturally is I'm kind of speaking for myself. Uh, my journey to the first incompleteness theorem uh, really was just kind of, I just fell into it via what I was looking at. Uh, I kind of just kind of, I kind of just arrived at it myself. Um, I didn't really like learn it from any particular book. Uh, and so I, I, in some sense, what I'm doing with, with these talks is I'm really trying to pass that on to somebody else because I think that that journey uh, could be summarized in a way that might be helpful for others. And I was already told by a lot of people that were struggling with the to understand this stuff in my talk that, that I made it really simple for them. So I wanted to pass that on to as many people as possible. So again, the, pro the plan is not to prove so much as understand and observe, but nonetheless, what we were going to be doing sort of looks like a proof. It's this, it, I've, I've been calling it a proof by absolutely shameless and brazen repeated application of the church Turing thesis. Obviously, we'll have to talk about what the church Turing thesis actually is, um, but that's sort of how you can think about this. But the overall plan, I can make it four steps, essentially. One is define and understand computation. That's, that's going to be a big, big chunk of this. Uh, two, observe the limitations of computability by way of the halting problem. Uh, three, establish connections between formal proof systems and computation as we understand it. 
and then four observe the consequences. At that point, we will have a house of cards that if we pull one of them immediately, the whole thing collapses. And that collapse is pretty satisfying, in my opinion. Uh, even if you haven't gone through all of the proofs of the little details, watching that collapse is is pretty fun. So that's the plan. So let's just get started. So let's start with the etymology of the word. Uh, the word computation was first used in the 17th century, 1646, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, at that point, you've probably heard this before, a uh, computer was not a machine, it was a profession. You were a computer. You, the person, uh, if you had a certain job uh, standing in, in, in real life, were a computer. You, people would call you one. Uh, one who computes, a calculator, a reckoner, specifically a person employed to make calculations in an observatory, in surveying, etc. So maybe you're somebody that sits at a desk and does the finances for, a, for some local lord, right, or something like that. That's a computer. It's a person. And so com computation uh, up to, uh, a case according to the, this dictionary, 1897, um, was referring to a distinctly human activity. It was, it was referring to human stuff, and that's where we're going to kind of stick this for a long time. Um, uh, that this, this is according to the – I mean, the, you know, so, so computer in the more modern sense as a calculating machine, that first popped up in 1897, but it was really popularized um, in the 1930s under, uh, w with, with Turing's work. And so we're going we're gonna to focus a lot on Turing in this first video. Um, in, in, in particular, we're going to read a, lo a, lo a large chunk out of his 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, uh, which is where he, he kind of spells out his famous imitation game. Uh, it, it, this 1950 paper is not the paper where he first defines his Turing machines. That was, I think, a 1937 paper. Um, but that paper is much more mathematical, much more technical. And this paper, it seems like, is, more, is written for a more general, non-mathematical audience. And because of that, that's not to say that it's weaker. In fact, I think it's a better paper. I think it's, it's, got, I think it's more honest. I think that it's, it's a paper in which Turing was less concerned with impressing his, peer, his colleagues and more concerned with um, getting across his intentions when he was giving those initial definitions. So I think this is probably, from what I've read of Turing, his most important paper, is specifically the section I'm going to read to you. Um, and so here's the first paragraph of this first section. I'm going to start after. I'm going to stop after the first sentence and talk about what he's doing here. But what he's doing here is he's defining. He's talking about digital computers. What are they, and how do they work? So notice, just first and foremost, what Turing is talking about here is machines. But he's talking. He's going to be talking about these machines, these digital computers, from a launching point, and that launching point is going to be. Uh, the profession that we talked about, that etymological origin of the word human computer. So let, let's kind of uh, read this. So the idea behind digital computers may be explained by saying that these machines are intended to carry out any operations which could be done by a human computer. The human computer is supposed to be following fixed rules. He has no authority to deviate from them in any detail. We may suppose that these rules are supplied in a book, which is altered whenever he is put onto a new job. He has also an unlimited supply of paper on which he does his calculations. We may also do his, he may also do his multiplications and additions on a desk machine, but this is not important. So again, uh, uh, not again, but, but, to, but to note what he's doing here, this is so important. What to Turing here, a computer is a machine built to model the action of a human computer. And he, he, he says that right at the beginning, the first sentence, and then he proceeds with the rest of this section to essentially define digital computers by making generalized assumptions about human computers. He's talking, the, the section is titled Digital Computers, but as I read it to you, you're going to realize very quickly that it's not about digital computers. This section is not about digital computers at all. It's about human computers. What he's doing is he's trying to define digital computers by modeling abstractly the process of the human act of human computation. And so he's going to be looking at human computation and trying to essentially distill out what's really going on here in general. When a human sits down to row reduce a matrix or multiply two numbers or solve an equation, what are they doing? And, and how do we model that generally by a machine? Like, and that, so that's, that's what he's going to be doing. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're obviously not trying to build a machine. We're trying to define computation as a phys philosophical concept. But we're going to follow Turing's lead. In order to define computation, what we're going to do is we're going to begin by looking at human computation 
not machine computation. I, I want to come back to that. Uh, and, and trying to distill out the essential features of that. So the image I want you to have in your head as we go through the rest of these videos is not uh, gears, it's not vacuum tubes, it's not transistors, it's not solid state drives, it's not light bulbs, it's not any machine that you can think of, which is what you're used to thinking of. If I told you, if I say the word computer to you, one of those images is going to pop into your head. Some machine process, some inhuman machine process is going to talk to you, pop up into your head. If you want to understand computation as a philosophical concept, you have to f you have to avoid that. You have to resist thinking about machines in the abstract. That is a fetishism. Uh, I actually have tend to call this in my head uh, computer fetishism, uh, to kind of which is sort of a play on on Marx's commodity fetishism. It's 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 a tendency to to um, essentially surrender some of the human agency to the extent that it can be talked about that way from computation. Computation is modeling of rigid in its in the first instance, it's it's modeling of a human act. Um, we're modeling our own processes here with machines. So in order to understand computation, we want to talk about the, the the human processes, not the machines. So if you hear the word computer and you're defaulting to thinking about the machines, you're already setting yourself up for failure. And so we want to avoid that. And so we're going to start with looking at human computation. So the image I want you to have in your head is this right here. It's a person at a desk with a pencil and a piece of paper. I realize, by the way, I said some of this already in my other videos, but this is supposed to be a self-contained mini-series. So uh, I might, I'm going to be repeating certain things that I say in that playlist that's more detailed. Um, so uh, I think I screwed up here, actually. I, th I think I lost a sentence. So let me back out of this and pull up the paper. Um, so here's the paper itself. Uh, if you go it's, a free, it's free to look, view if you just give it a Google search. Um, so we're right here. If we use the above explanation as a definition, we'll sh we shall be in danger of circularity of argument. We avoid this by giving an outline of the means by which the desired effect is achieved. A digital computer can usually be regarded as consisting of three parts. And so this is th these three parts are the key, I think, to understanding computation as a concept. And these three parts, according to him, are store, executive unit, and control. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. The store is a store of information and corresponds to the human computer's paper, whether this is the paper on which he does his calculations or that on which his book of rules is printed. Insofar as the human computer does calculations in his head, a part of the store will correspond to his memory. Um, so that's the first paragraph, but it's the most important, I think, in this whole section. Uh, now, again, just to kind of note what he's doing and, and to kind of understand what we just said we wanted to do, these sound like machine things. When you hear store, what are you thinking of? Hard drives, right? Disks, something like that. Executive unit, what are you thinking about? You're thinking of like machine heads writing things down. You're thinking of a printer or something. When you think about control, you're thinking about, I don't know, um, uh, you know, a CPU or something like that, right? But you understand, but, but he, that's not what he's saying at all. What he's doing here is he's, he's, gener he's, he's taking, he's using these more abstract words to generalize the particular, what he considers the essential aspects of human computation. What is the store? It's the paper. That's what he's saying. It's just, instead of paper in general, what we're going to end up with is something more general than paper, and he's calling that the store. But it's, 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 the, it's where the information is stored, it's the environment, it's what, you, it's what you're doing things on. Um, the, the, the pencil he's replacing with this more abstract notion of an executive unit. The pencil is, is the medium uh, by which you can interact with the store. It's, it's, your, it's, the medi it's the mediating interface between you and the environment. He's just taking this concept of the pencil and saying, what is this more generally? Same thing with the human brain. He's, he's taking that and replacing it with this abstraction of a control. Um, but throughout, again, throughout this whole section, despite using these words, we really are talking about mind, pen, and paper. Mind, pen, and paper. So at this point, my plan was just to continue reading until I got to these uh, particular two paragraphs. But then uh, after recording that, I kind of realized that um, while most I would like I, I, I would I think you should read this section very carefully yourself. Um, the what he's saying in here doesn't really um, uh, have much influence on what I'm trying the points that I'm trying to get across in this video. So I'm going to I'm going to leave uh, the next several paragraphs uh, for you to read if you want to. And I'm just going to skip down um, to this section, to this part right here. 
The reader must accept it as a fact that digital computers can be constructed and indeed have been constructed according to the principles we have described and that they can in fact mimic the actions of a human computer very closely. So note that he's been talking about machines uh, in a very machine-like way, right? He's coding instructions with these big numbers and stuff. But then he brings it back. He's saying, wait, stop, remember, we are talking about the at mimicking the actions of human computers. That's the goal. That's what we're trying to do here. Again, don't get lost in the machine language. Don't get lost in the zeros and the ones, or in this case, the digits. Remember, and he, he thinks it's important too, remember, we are talking about human computation. We're talking about mind, pen, and paper. The book of rules which we have, and he, he goes on with it. He goes on on that note here. Uh, the book of rules which we have described our human computer as using is, of course, a convenient fiction. Actual human computers really remember what they have got to do. If one wants to make a machine mimic the behavior of, a, of the human computer in some complex operation, one has to ask him how it is done and then translate the action answer into the form of an instruction table. I think the more modern way to say instruction table would be decision matrix, but yeah. Uh, constructing instruction tables is usually described as programming. To program a machine to carry out the operation A means to put the appropriate instruction table into the machine so that it will do A. So this is a really interesting paragraph because it, it, this is the paragraph where Tur Turing is defining what he means by programming. What is programming to Turing here? Programming is to take the action of a human computation. When I, when I row reduce a matrix, right, I know what to do. I've been trained. I know how to do it. I know the process. Somebody might come up. It, what, to, what programming is to Turing is it's somebody coming up to me, asking me, how do you do that? And me explaining it and then putting it down into um, uh, 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 something that can be implemented in some other, uh, some other way, essentially transcribing those instructions down. In a, in a way that can be can be done elsewhere in, in some other manner, that's programming. Um, and that is programming. I think you know there's no denying that that is what programming is. That's what we do when we're programmers. Um, and I think that that's where I'm going to stop in terms of reading directly off of this. So that gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. So that's what Turing has to say, and now you're going to hear what I have to say. And I want to think about these three components in, and, and think more about them in terms of uh, how do they interact, right? So we have the essential components, and I think Turing is absolutely correct here, that these are the three essential features of, of computation. These three things, store, executive, unit, control, pencil, paper, mind. Um, but how do they interact? What's the process? 